Welcome, First Baptist Church, on this May 31st, Lord's Day for worship. We're glad that you have joined us from your home for worship for this hour-long time of ascribing to God his worth and his value as we lift up to him praises and music and uh, through message and through the reading of his word. I have a scripture passage here from Psalm 36, 1 through 10. It says, An oracle is within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for in his own eyes he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. Even on his bed he plots evil. He commits himself to a sinful course and does not reject what is wrong. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink for your river of delights. For you is the fountain of life. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For evil men will be cut off, and those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who gave his life as a sacrifice, that he endured the suffering and shame of the cross, and through his sacrifice, Father, we have atonement. We have reconciliation through the blood that he shed. Father, thank you that while we were yet dead in our trespasses, Christ came to us and made us alive. Therefore, Father, we rejoice in the reconciliation that you have brought to us, that you had first loved us, and Father, we do love you in return. Thank you for, thank you for your faithfulness. May we give you praise. And Father, may you bless this time as we lift up worship to you and give you thanks in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. All o'er those wide extended plains shines one eternal day. There God the sun forever reigns and scatters night away. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. When shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my father's face and in his bosom rest? I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will go, go with me? I am bound for the promised land. Good morning from Miss Gloria's back porch. This is our last children's message from the back porch. Even if the church still does online services, um, I'll probably do children's messages on those too if they decide to do those through the summer. And I will probably move indoors. It's getting a little warm on Miss Gloria's back porch here in the summertime. So my last children's message from the back porch, I wanted to kind of just do a wrap up of what we've been talking about all this time while we've all been kind of stuck, right, at home with the virus going around. So, um... We ran up some bags. They're in the big box. The big box is no longer here. It's at church. And Brother Tim has it placed somewhere strategically, I'm sure, for all of you to grab a bag. So in each bag, there's a back porch bag. And each bag is full of stuff. And I was going to just remind us of what we've talked about these past eight weeks that we have been away from church in terms of gathering together as a church. Maybe you remember Palm Sunday. We had our clappers where we talked about Hosanna, praising the Lord as he came in the week before Easter Sunday. And on the back, it tells you that blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So we have our palm clappers. We also have a resurrection egg with something inside. You can see what's inside your egg. So you have an egg in there. Um, the week after that, we talked a little bit about some projects, things that you were doing around your house, things that we were doing. I'm proud to say our treehouse is painted all the way, <laughs> finally. Uh, that turned out to be a bigger project than we anticipated. And so to remind you of projects, I had some stickers, some project stickers, cement mixers and things like that. Also a good segue into Vacation Bible School this summer because it's all about construction. The week after Project Week, um, we skipped a week, and then the next week we talked about um, being content with how God made us, Psalm 139. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Miss Gloria talked about her hair, how it was straight. And so you will get one of two options in your bag. You'll get a straight straw, like my, my hair, 
or you'll get a curly straw, which is how I tried to make my hair look when I was growing up. So that's also in your bag, one of the two. The next week was Mother's Day. And so I have in there some little butterfly stickers that you can keep or you could give maybe one to mom if you feel like it. They're very nice and butterfly for mom. The next week we talked about things that are valuable and how God gives us an inheritance. And I don't have actual gold coins to give you. I do have the candy chocolate gold coins. So in your bags, there are some little, little chocolate coins in there, a chocolate coin. And then last week we talked about Memorial Day and why we celebrate it. Why do we celebrate... Um, Kind of a sad day. Why do we remember those men and women who sacrificed for us? Um, and we talked about that last week. And in your bag, I also have a little wooden firecracker. Now, you can't pull it and it pops. I tried. I kind of thought that's what I was going to do when I bought them, but it doesn't. It's just a little wooden firecracker as a decoration. So you can use these again on the 4th of July, maybe. And as I thought back over all of these weeks and all the stuff for the back porch bag that I've been collecting and the messages I've been doing back here, it's made me think about kind of those themes that we see throughout the Bible. What do we see? There's lots of them, things that you can read about in Genesis, and you'll hear it in the book of Matthew, and you'll hear it in Revelation. You see it, the whole book, the whole Bible contains themes, things that God keeps talking about. And there's so many of them. There's grace, and there's faith, and there's salvation, and there's redemption, and all sorts of themes that you can talk about. And... I wondered what it would be that I would want to talk about this week in terms of a brief little children's message. And I decided to go with the idea of sacrifice because that's kind of what we've been doing the last two months, hasn't it? It's been a bit of a sacrifice to stay home, to not go to school, to not go to work for some of your parents. It's been a sacrifice to, to forego birthday parties and things like that and backyard barbecues and all. And so we've, we've understood that maybe a little bit better in these two months, the idea of sacrificing. But I also like to remind us too that that concept of sacrificing, that theme is throughout the entire Bible. It starts all the way in the book of Genesis and it goes all the way to the end, to Revelation. And of course, you know the ultimate sacrifice that was made, right? Christ on death on Calvary to take care of the sins for you, for me, and the sins of the whole wide world. That's the greatest sacrifice that was ever made. The other sacrifice is that I wanted to just mention was the sacrifice God wants from us. It's not just staying holed up and staying socially distant and wearing a mask and things like that. Those are all well and good. But God's sacrifice that he asks from us is a very simple one. You find it in a couple of the Gospels. He says that he wants you to, first and foremost, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. And those are the two, the great commandments, as they're called in the New Testament. And those are the two that I have been thinking about the most, especially during these last two months, about loving the Lord your God. He wants us to do it with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole strength our whole soul, because that's the part that's going to live in eternity with him. And he wants us to love him that way. And then he wants us to love our neighbor as ourself. So remember that, y'all, as we go about still trying to figure out how things are going to play out um, in our world around us and how things are going to get to a new normal, as they keep talking about, or possibly just go back to normal. We'll see how all of that works out. But remember that the ultimate commandment from God is that we love him. And that the second one is that we love our neighbor. So I thank y'all all for coming to my back porch these last eight weeks. If we do some more children's messages, they will probably not be on the back porch. They will be in the air conditioning, more than likely inside the house somewhere. So thank y'all for joining me, and I hope you get to pick up your bags as soon as possible and enjoy the things that are inside it.
this world below there is no sick this toil or danger in that bright world to which I go I'm going there to meet my father I'm going there no more to roam I'm just going over Jordan I am just going I know dark clouds will gather o'er me. I know my pathways rough and steep, but golden fields lie out before me. I want to sing salvation story in concert with the blood washed band. I want to wear a crown of glory when I get I'll soon be free from every trial. This form will rest beneath the sod. I'll drop the cross of self denial. Good morning. My name is Nathan Giesenschlag, and it's my privilege to bring to you a sermon this morning entitled, The Long Defeat, The Greater Hope, and The Final Victory. I am a historian by trade, and I am also a bivocational minister. 
which in the Baptist faith, as many of you know, is, means that you uh, work Monday through Friday, and then on Sunday you preach. I uh, preached at Shiloh Baptist Church up in the greater Robertson County era, area for a few years, and uh, being a bivocational minister uh, was quite an uh, interesting and challenging time of my life. But I'm a historian uh, trained up. I went to school at Texas State University for my master's degree, Texas Lutheran, and I've taught at Glenn College for, at this point, about 17, 18 years. And uh, one of the things I've come to appreciate in history is that of telling the story. And the story oftentimes includes a beginning and an end. Sometimes it can be linear in this telling of the story, or it could be more circular with an li overall linear theme. That idea of going from a line from one to the other, the beginning to the end. Uh, and for all of us, we have a story to tell. And for all of us, we have a line that we walk. We're traveling on, uh, on a level of time, as it has been said before. But we live in a modern era. And the modern era, or modernity as it's often called, can be traced to, at its headwaters, the Protestant Reformation in the late, early 1500s, with Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox. Arguably, even the most earliest of waters would be John Huss. Our friends in the uh, Caldwell and Burleson County community, who are brethren uh, and, and, and are members of the unity of the brethren denomination, they take their heritage from John Huss of the Czech Republic, or to the, us, the Czech Republic. Well, anyways, but modernity really catches its wind. Modernity really takes off during what is known as historically the Enlightenment period. That time period from the late 17th century all the way through the 18th century would include individuals such as Thomas Jefferson, uh, John Adams, uh, using two American examples, Benjamin Franklin, another an American example, or say from across the pond, John Locke is a very famous English example. Now, the Enlightenment placed a heavy emphasis on reason, observation, science, arithmetic, to answer the great questions of life. And in some respects, the Enlightenment tries, or at least uh, it is sometimes interpreted to have tried to replace religion to answer those questions. But one of the things that you get uh, in the Enlightenment is this idea of progress, the confidence of progress. But then, we look further beyond the Enlightenment period, which ends somewhere around 1800, 1815, perhaps with the collapse of Napoleon. But we also see during the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century and into the 20th century, you see great advances in health, the longevity uh, of man, in the sense that in those industrialized nations like the United States, like Western Europe and elsewhere, you see people living far, far longer. So that's an idea of longevity. And frankly, just simply material comfort. Many of you watching this today, perhaps especially if you have a, a little or maybe a lot of silver in your hair, you can think back to a time when it was a lot uh, that Texas or Caldwell or Burleson County was much, much poorer. There wasn't the abundance of seemingly everything that we have today. And in that process, the West coming in now into the modern era, into the pro present time, has developed a firm belief in the idea of progress. You could almost take progress and put it with a capital P if you wanted to. I wouldn't, but you might. And it is hard to argue, frankly, against the changes that have made life easier and better, at least in some ways. Yet for all the faith and progress, we are still hampered by many, if not most, of the same ultimate limitations that our ancestors worked under. They may take different forms, but those limitations and those pitfalls still exist. We still face the ultimate problem of our own mortality and the road that leads to it. Men or women, rich or poor, Christian or not, we all must suffer through a long defeat. And that is where we start today in the title of the sermon. The long defeat is a concept that is not particularly Christian, and it has its roots in antiquity. However, the Bible, in its Old Testament form and its New Testament form, also talks about this idea of the long defeat. And that uh, when we talk about this long defeat, we're talking about being born, growing to adulthood, and coming into uh, age, and eventually death. But no book of the Bible, perhaps save maybe the Psalms in some places, talks about or has this overarching theme of the long defeat, and the long life, and the cycles of life. Any, uh, no book does uh, that better or more thoroughly than the book of Ecclesiastes. 
And if you would, please turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I'll read uh, this out of the New American Standard Version. Now, chapter 12, verse 1, reading on through verse 8. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, when you say, will say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened, and the clouds return after the rain. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble, the mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and those who look through the windows grow dim. And the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low, and one will arise at the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blo blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, and the capybara is ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home while the mourners go about the street. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. The pitcher by the well is shattered and the will at the cistern is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit of God, or the Spirit, will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Well, now, while I chose these verses to be the home text for today's sermon, much of Ecclesiastes reads like the long defeat. It is written by Solomon late in his life, after he had been blessed by God by great wisdom, blessed by God with immeasurable wealth, blessed by God uh, with uh, power and prestige, where people would travel, uh, famously the Queen of Sheba, would travel many miles to speak to Solomon to hear him pronounce on this matter or that. And he was also blessed by God with long life. But it was written by Solomon late in his life. And if you know the story of Solomon, Solomon's life starts out well, but it ends in frustration, if not outright, uh, at times, evil. His life was a very human life, and he writes this as an epilogue of his life, a retrospective looking back at things he did and things he did not do well, and more especially, observations of the wise man, or as he calls himself in Ecclesiastes, the preacher. And it seems to have done this, and he sets the tone of Ecclesiastes of a man with regret, and frankly, much regret. Now, the long defeat occurs to all who walk this earth, and that is true of individuals, humans. It is true for churches. Not the church, mind you. The church general will always exist until Christ uh, takes her home. But there are individual churches that are no more, sadly. It's true of nations and nature. The closing chapter of Ecclesiastes speaks of the inevitable decay that sets in for all who live that long life, or just simply live. And if we look through a few verses here in this home text, uh, verses 3 and 4, uh, we'll uh, make a few points there, and you'll see uh, Solomon developing that theme. And remember, when he wrote chapter 12, he's speaking to young men and to young women. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Because it won't always be thus. You won't always be this young man full of vim and vigor and be able to walk your own way uh, and to do what you wish. Uh, and actually, if you think about it, uh, Solomon was, uh, was giving a bit of a, a preview of what Jesus says to Peter late uh, in his uh, ministry where he says to Peter, Peter, you walk and go where you want to. And I'm paraphrasing more than quoting directly now. But there will be a time you will be girded in a way that you don't. You will go a place you will not want to go. And that for many of us. Uh, to some degree or another, is true. But if we look at verses 3 and 4, especially verse 3 in chapter 12, Ecclesiastes, in the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and the mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and those who look through the windows grow dim. For those of you who are watching this today, and you know many men and many women who, when you look at that, in the day that the watchmen of the house tremble, if you think about it, especially in the time of Solomon, in the time of antiquity, what would be the illusion, what would be the metaphor of the watch of the houseman? It would be these, your hands. Watch of the houseman, protect it. Protect you, protect your household, protect your family. But as you know well, some of you know uh, personally, these hands sometimes start to quiver and shake as age advances. And then the mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle. 
You've also seen strong men who in their prime were uh, the epitome of strength, yet by the time they become older men or even older women, they begin to bow down. And the grinding ones stand idle because there are few, and the eye uh, is simply an allusion to the teeth, while those who look through the windows grow dim is probably an allusion to the, uh, the darkening of eyes. Without modern medicine, uh, a blindness or partial blindness was far more common than it is today. But we come to the long defeat uh, of each individual. How many of you simply know people who in their youth and prime were strong and tall and they had dark hair or simply, and I'm going to pick up my father a bit because some of you know him, had hair. And no matter what one does in a modern sense, especially say from rigorous exercise to cosmetic treatments, the long defeat still advances upon us. But as we consider the physical decline of man, we turn next to this material, or rather his mental regression. And again, Solomon considers this in verse 6, and we'll look at it very quickly. Remember him, that is remembering God. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. Many commentators seem to think that, uh, that uh, Solomon is referring back to the silver cord would be the back, or the golden bowl, perhaps the mind, or the brain. And so when we look at that, one of the sad parts of life and, and uh, the advancement of age is simply that, is it's not just the physical decline, but we also are also afflicted by things we cannot remember anymore. And that uh, sets in true even for a 42-year-old man like myself at times. But while we look at the grim facts of life, we might be tempted to become bitter and grumble at our diminished glory. And I use those, that word advisedly, glory. The Bible, our guide to our faith in life, is honest, but it's never bitter at the, at the idea or the, the reality of aging and death. They are a part of life. Or as Solomon writes in chapter 3, that it is a season of life. And if you're familiar with chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, I'd invite you to turn with me. Maybe you can just know it off the top of your head. For some of you watching this, you learn chapter 3 not by reading the Bible, but by listening to a book, or excuse me, a song from the 1960s by the birds called Turn, Turn, Turn. And it starts off here in chapter 3, and I won't read the whole uh, part, but you get the uh, gist of it, a season or a time for everything, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to mourn and a time to dance, and on and on you can go. We too may not like to age, and we may regret the decline of this or that prowess we once possessed. Maybe the ability to throw a baseball, maybe the ability to recall pieces of uh, information you read 20 years ago off of a shelf and say, I can't do that anymore. Whatever that is, it, it, it's the cycle of life. It is the march of time. It is, pro, it is progress in a sense, even though we would not like that progress. But whether, whatever it may be, we should never become embittered nor despondent about it. Because, like I said, this is the natural progress of life. Another pernicious out, uh, aspect of the long defeat is spiritual regression or simply coldness. While there are often times and seasons when we are closer to God than in others, such as, say, when a crisis falls upon us, we go to God in prayer. We pray fervently, God help us, God deliver us, which is right and good. We find ourselves in prayer with the Almighty. We pray, find ourselves praying to the Lord Jesus, help me, like Peter did when he was falling through the waters. But it is also true for with perhaps the exception of the greatest of saints, is that there are times in our lives where we become cold or at least more indifferent to the warmth of religion, the warmth of the Lord, the warmth of worship, and so forth. And we should take double care to avoid the apathy and the return of sin in our lives when we find ourselves late in life before it is too late. We should strive fervently to uh, fight that regression 
of our faith. The great Puritan theologian and preacher John Owen encouraged and pleaded with his hearers and, and listeners to avail themselves to the means of grace. And as I said just a moment ago, all those who are Christian, whether they were baptized at an early age, at age seven, and walk through life through, with uh, Christ hand in hand, or even those who are perhaps a little later in their, their faith walk, they came to faith as a middle-aged man or woman. All but the greatest of saints seemingly have these dry moments of life. But what John Owen would plead for you to do is he would tell you, be, uh, uh, take the means of grace, bring it to you. And that would include prayer. Where times are that you may, not pray, you may not pray, pray. When there are times when you may not feel like reading the Bible, read the Bible. Make a point to go back through perhaps the most favorite book of the Bible that you have. Go back to those foundational things that once uh, enlivened you. Perhaps read the Psalms. You Reading the Psalms, by the way, is very good for the soul because you are not alone. You are not the only person who's ever gone through periods of trial and dryness. And never, never neglect the assembling of the saints. Sadly, uh, we are having to record this because of the virus that is amok in society right now. It, it is what it is. However, when the time comes and it is safe for us to do so, we should all come back together, join hands once more. There's nothing like communing with our fellow saints. It's a, it's a horizontal effect, and it's also a vertical effect as well. We should never forsake the assembling of ourselves unless the most dire circumstances demand it. But according to Owen, there's one other, another facet that you may take into mind. If for you who are watching this today have noticed in your life in the last year, two years, what have you, a slackening or a lessening of your affection for the Lord Jesus, Owen would say, uh, rectify the problem. Fix this problem. Pray. And all those things I just mentioned to you. Yet he would also offer you a words of encouragement. For those who are Christian and those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross and his resurrection and so forth, those who are of that persuasion and those who believe, they will be bothered by their lack of affection. It will eat at them. It will gnaw at them. It is the Spirit calling you forth and saying, come home. Come back to the Lord. Renew your affections for the Lord Jesus. That is the Spirit within you. And what it should give for you is assurance. Had there ever been a moment in your life where you wondered, am I a believer? But if you come in this moment here of uh, spiritual dryness and you say, this is not right, that is a form of assurance that the Lord gives you. The elect care. Those who believe care. And they will do things, they will move mountains, as it were, to get right with the Lord once more. To get close to him once more. To have that, that, that walk that they enjoyed in years gone by. But the idea of the long defeat has other potential pitfalls for the Christian in that when one considers what awaits us in our progressing and advancing years, we could rest on our laurels or simply despair of doing good to glorify the Lord God. Because the reason we might despair is, is that we look around, we say, there's so much wickedness and evil about us. The Bible not only speaks about aging and death, but Paul late in his life remarks to Timothy that as time unfolds and the end times uh, are approach, the days would become worse and worse. Yet we are commanded to do good. I, I say this, and if you would turn with me very briefly to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Many of you know this by heart because you've heard it preached before. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful and arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents and ungrateful and unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Those are, the, as, the, as the days darken and, and the end times approach, we find that. And so you may despair what good. It's fair to remember, too, by the way, that Paul wrote many of his epistles while in jail under the thumb and under the persecution of either Jewish uh, temple authorities or more especially Roman authority uh, in Rome. 
we also find, too, that uh, even in the dark hours, in the dark days, we find ourselves uh, emulating the life of Peter. Peter is going to be persecuted, and his uh, first epistle is written to a persecuted community. So even in dark times, we should not let our spiritual dryness and our age hurt us. We're not called to retire. We're called to equip. We're called to teach. We're called to go. Just like the apostles were, just like preachers are, we as Christians are called to do. And we do, even in the face of dark times. Yet even in our striving to live, as Christ would have us to do so, our contribution to society means we would like to see evil and depravity reduced, or at least as best we can, temporarily eliminated. And at times, we may be actually successful. And I think back as a historian for just a moment of your time, I think back to this great struggle against alcohol. Now, in the, in the main, some of you may be saying, well, didn't prohibition fail? And yes, it did. No two ways about that. But the reason you had prohibition, or before it was called prohibition, was temperance, was because the United States had a real and pernicious problem with alcohol. People drank in wild excess. Many, many lives and many families were ruined. Yet the church became indignant about it. This church, First Baptist Church, became indignant about it. Now you can argue about whether one should drink or not, but drunkenness is not, permit is not good for a Christian, and it's not good for society. And so the church went out and it spoke, and it spoke with a voice. It's true for this church. It's true for the Baptist movement in general. It's, it was true for the Methodist as well. But also more recently, drunk driving, which used to be winked and nodded at it, there were many who were upset and moved by that. And we can even talk about the reduction of the abortion rate in most modern terms. But the fact of the matter is, is that one of the things we may see is that in some instances there is a redu reduction of evil in society and all to the glory of God. But yet you as a, as a person who is aging may say, what will they do, the next generation? What will the next generation be doing? Will they be able to keep up the progress? Will they be able to keep up the guard? Well, the fact is, is that uh, it is not for us to worry with too, mu uh, be, uh, too much, frankly, much at all. And I would reach for here now a little quote from uh, the Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote about such an issue when he was uh, uh, in writing his book, the, uh, the, the, well, Lord of the Rings, but The Return of the King. And this is a discussion that he uh, puts into the mouth of Gandalf the White, Gandalf the Wizard. And this is what Tolkien says through his character Gandalf about what happens in the future. Other evils are that may come. Yet it is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule. And so for us, in our progress, in our walk along life, we plan and try to leave the best to our, our offspring and to those generations that will follow us. But we cannot control the future. We can only live this life that we walk along. But ultimately in this quote, you get the same sort of advice from Solomon's Ecclesiastes with his idea of seasons and comparisons, and in Solomon's case, almost grandfather-like observations. Even the end of the book itself is distilled, distilled with the summations of the right life. In the last chapter, in the last verses, Solomon writes, the conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments. For all the talk of the long defeat, though, those who found, are found in Christ have a greater hope in the final victory over, over life and over death and over evil as well. Hope is one of those wonderful words that is found throughout, of course, all of humanity, but still sweeter and greater when the Christian takes it on. In the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes eloquently about love. But in the three great uh, examples, he says faith, hope, and love. And he also writes again in Romans about the hope that is within us. And the hope produces perseverance. 
And he is writing this under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Hope is that wonderful thing that God has given to us. Now, Peter, back to 1 Peter, that epistle that he has, Peter says that we have a living hope through the resurrected Jesus. And in, later in 1 Peter 30 and 15, he, con- he commands us to make a defense to everyone who asks to give an account for the hope that is in you. Now, briefly, two hopes we have that transcend the long defeat. And the long defeat of life is overcome by our Christian hope. It is the glory of God and the hope of eternal life. The hope of the glory of God is our great hope, and it is in which we rest. In chapter 17 of John's high priestly prayer, Jesus makes the emphatic connection of the glory of the Trinity that predates the world and that is given to those, the apostles and all who would believe. When you go to the high priestly prayer of John 17, you see Jesus glorifying the Father. You see Jesus uh, saying that he will be glorified by the Father in a reciprocal part. Then the promise of the Spirit, and it's going to be given to all who are called out. Friends, we are in the glory of the Lord. We are called into his glory. And when we are done with this uh, life, we will go into the glory of the Lord. We will be uh, in such a wonderful condition. It is unimaginable. And those are promises that we can uh, keep when you have that high priestly prayer and when the darkness comes around you and the weariness of life is about you. Go to the high priestly prayer. Hold on to those promises very uh, dearly. They will be fulfilled. A second great hope that we have is that, uh, that Jesus has overcome death, and that is the hope of eternal life. Paul speaks about it in his pastoral epistles time and again, especially particularly to Titus. But our hope of eternal life gives us the ability to persevere. The hope of eternal life gives us the ability to holiness. That when we walk in hope, when we walk in faith, when we walk in the ways of Christ, we will become more like him and we will be confirmed in our faith and we will be confirmed as a Christian. But we will be like him. And that is a glorious promise. But it's also this hope of eternal life gives us power to, uh, as an encouragement to service. Think of this the parable of the talents. The, uh, the servant or slave who was given five talents goes out and serves. And he has said, uh, well, done, good that, well, do, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I mix my versions a little bit. I apologize. King James on the one hand and New American Standard on the other. But a third point, very briefly, for the hope of eternal life allows us to endure suffering. You see it in Romans when Paul writes about it there in chapter 5. You see it more particularly in chapter 3 of Philippians. And he goes on and talks about being able to endure all things for the hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. So those are some great and beautiful hopes that we have. Those are the things that uh, transcend and overcome the long defeat And when we have that eternal life and we grab hold of the crown of life, we have that great and final victory. And we're welcomed home and welcomed into heaven. The great victory, the great great victory, the greater hope, and the long defeat in the background. In conclusion, to quote the King James Version of Job 14, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is uh, is cut. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Those words that are found in the most ancient book of the Bible are those words of the long defeat. And it is the lot of man after the fall of Adam. And if the fall of Adam took place in the garden, we commence the travel. And in verse, Job, in verse 5, Job speaks saying, Seeing that his days are determined, the number of his uh, months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. We could despair, though like the Bible, we don't despair at the long defeat because we have the greater hope of deliverance and rest in the glory of God in heaven. When the darkness crowds around us, let us hold tightly to the hope of Jesus and our final victory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gracious words of Solomon, a man who had done much and had did much wrong. He had very much feet of clay like we all do. But gracious Lord, he wrote and he warned us. 
Blessed Lord, when the times are tough and those uh, evils and darkness and the hardships of life crowd around us, let us hold on as tightly as we may to your promises, the precious prayer promises that we read of in the high priestly prayer and elsewhere in the Gospels. Gracious Lord, we know that you will never lose us nor forsake us. We take that uh, blessed assurance and we live with it. Gracious Lord, have mercy upon us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.